Hello, and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church in Germantown's regular Sunday service of worship. I am the head pastor, the Reverend Rebecca Seegers, and it is my joy and privilege to have you worshiping with us this day. 
I do want to lift up a couple of announcements for you in the area of pastoral care. This past week, we lost Grace Moraney, a beloved long-term member of our congregation, a woman who loved music and was so faithfully a part of our choir. When she was able to be with us, she has been homebound for a significant period of time now, but I know that your hearts are with her and her extended family and all of us who will mourn her loss. Additionally, I would like to lift up today uh, Arlene Grace, who came through surgery on Wednesday successfully, but who would still appreciate your love and your prayers <clears throat> and other expressions of support as she begins the healing process. Finally, I just want to lift up that our window on the week that came attached in your email gives you the myriad of things that are going on in this congregation that remains active and vibrant even in the midst of the challenges of COVID-19. And also that we will be hosting an in-person worship opportunity on World Communion Sunday, October 4th. More information is coming in a myriad of ways for you for that service. And don't worry, if you don't feel safe coming out, even with all of the safety parameters put in place, we will also be live streaming that service. So you can see not only me and others that always are supporting worship, like Reverend Kevin Porter and uh, others, but you will also be able to see those who do come and attend. So hopefully Communion Sunday will be one in which we can feel even more like the community that we remain even in the midst of these challenging times. Now come, let us worship the Lord. Friends, let us call one another to worship. Coming from places that have seen better days, coming with our breath taken away by grief, Coming to worship, seeking a hope that will endure. Coming to worship, seeking a hope that will endure. Coming together, even as we are apart. Coming to worship the Lord. Friends, when we think about the word pride, often we think about it as uh, thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought. Uh, I was instructed by reading a, a devotion by Chris Glosser, a Presbyterian a minister uh, who wrote a devotional book many years ago, to look at pride differently and to think of it more like thinking of ourselves in eyes of uh, anything other than what God would have us see ourselves or our neighbors. So that could be either more highly than we ought or less high than we ought. 
all of us are imperfect vessels, yet by God's grace, when we speak truth of who we are, able to be used by God to be vessels of God's grace and glory. So in that spirit, let us put aside our pride and speak truth of who God would call us to be and how we have fallen short. Let us confess our sins. God of infinite patience, oh, how we love to complain. The journey is too long. We are hungry, we are thirsty, we are tired and want to go home. Life isn't fair. This isn't what we signed up for. You've heard it all before, faithful one. You'll hear it again. Yet do not forsake us in our grumbling, but shower us with your blessings of old. For we are weary of our own complaining and long to make a fresh start. Open our lips to sing songs of gratitude and we will be reborn. Open our minds to the glories of your love and we will shine like the sun. In your holy name we pray, amen. Friends, hear God's good news for you and for me. This week, it's taken from a portion of Romans, the third chapter, as well as a portion of the Heidelberg Catechism. Listen as it speaks to you and me of God's amazing grace. Righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. By faith, I have a deep-rooted assurance created in me by the Holy Spirit through the gospel that out of sheer grace earned for us by Christ, not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven have been made forever right with God and have been granted salvation. Friends, believe the good news of this gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Yes, friends, God bestows peace, peace on all who accept God's amazing grace. And in that peace, we are able to share the peace of Christ with one another, even as we accept it for ourselves. So even here and now, in all of our relationships, let us extend the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal and loving God, give us the grace to welcome your word today, the desire to understand it and take it to heart, and the faithfulness and the courage to share, not just with each other, but with those in the world we live in every day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first lesson today is from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verse 10 through chapter four, verse 11. Listen now to what God's word says to us. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestill by fleeing to Teresh. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, 
take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed through the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry at the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I'd like to invite the young people to join me at this time. Hi, everybody. How are you doing this week? You doing okay? It is still such a hard time, isn't it? I find that I get angry a lot. And I've been noticing that the people around me get angry a lot, too. This is it's very frustrating, I think, because it's been going on for such a long time and we keep being challenged in, in how we're supposed to, to do what we need to do in completely different circumstances. And then it's also challenging because all kinds of things go on in our lives that aren't related to this. Maybe it's, it's school or people we love or there's all kinds of stuff happening. And sometimes we can get angry. So I made an angry mask. I actually put this in the uh, email that you guys got. I asked Sharice if she would please also put that in along with the window on the week in the bulletin so that if you want to make an angry mask to show when you're angry, you can do that too. So it's the outline and then you color it in and I just put mine on a knife so that I can pick it up easily, put it on a little bit of cardboard and, and, and taped a knife to it to hold it up so that when I get angry, you can see I've got my angry mask on. So why did I choose this today? Well, you may have noticed when Mr. Chris read the scripture that Jonah has his angry mask on too. How much do you know about the story of Jonah? Most of us know that part, the first part, right? Where God sends Jonah to Nineveh. He says, I want you to go tell these people they're messing up and they need to repent. And so Jonah doesn't want to do that. And he hops on a boat and runs far away from the Lord and a great storm comes up. And so when the sailors figure out that it has been caused by Jonah, they toss him overboard and he gets eaten up by a big fish. And he stays inside the big fish for three days until he repents. And the big fish spits him up on the land, right? We know that part of the story. And then he goes to Nineveh. And he tells the people to repent, that they are messing up, that they need to turn to the Lord. And you know what? They do. They do. They repent and they turn to the Lord. And you know what happens then? The Lord forgives them. And Jonah... He puts his angry face on. Jonah is really mad. Why is Jonah mad? Why is Jonah angry? Well, if we take off this angry mask and we look at what's going on behind it, the people of Nineveh were really mean. And they were really mean 
to the people of Israel, to Jonah's people. So when God forgave them, he put on his angry mask. But if we look behind that angry mask, what do you think Jonah was feeling? Maybe he was frustrated. Maybe he was hurt that God would take care of these people that were so mean to him. Sometimes when we put on our angry mask, we're really hiding other feelings. And that happens again in our story because Jonah kind of stomps out of Nineveh and he sits down outside it. He's angry. And the Lord has a tree grow up over Jonah. And he has this beautiful shade and he's in this beautiful day and he starts to feel better. But overnight, the Lord brings a worm and it eats up that tree. And the tree withers and dies. And then the Lord sends a scorching sun. And Jonah is sitting out there and he's hot and the tree's dead. And what does he do? He puts on his angry mask. That's right. He says, oh, I'm so angry. And God says, how angry are you? I'm so angry I could die. Anybody ever said that before? He's really mad. But really, he's just masking something else. What do you think is behind Jonah's angry mask? Yeah, maybe he's hurt, right? God supposedly put this bush over him to make him feel cool and, and supported and loved, and, and then it withered. Maybe he feels like God doesn't love him or care about him. Maybe his feelings are hurt. Maybe he's sad. Sometimes when we're hurt or sad or frustrated, we put on our angry mask, don't we? Well, that's why I thought it would be a good idea to make one. So you can remember that in these days, these challenging days, sometimes when we put on our angry mask, there's something else behind it. Maybe we can, we can think about what that might be. What are we really feeling? Are we sad or frustrated or hurt? or disappointed, and maybe then we can talk to our parents or a grown-up that we love to help us kind of figure out how to let go of that anger, how to repent, like the Ninevites do. How to remember that God loves us and how to deal with our feelings in this challenging time. I hope you get your angry mask and you make it. And you remember when you're wearing it, whether it's the one that you make or the one that we sometimes show, that really what's behind it might be something else and that God loves us no matter what. Amen.
The second scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Listen for God's word to you. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, this last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. God, we thank you for your word. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the words we heard read today from your holy book. And now, as we listen to these words which come from my lips, I most humbly pray that you would pour through me the gift of preaching, that they remain no longer simply my words, but instead are transformed into your living words to each and every person who hears them, that they might be met in exactly their place of need. We pray this, Lord, in great anticipation and in the strong name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. So, 2020. It's been quite a year, hasn't it? It has been the most challenging year of my life, perhaps of yours as well. It feels like it's been never ending with trauma after trauma, challenge after challenge. You remember the Me Too movement? We opened with that, with a reckoning of how women are treated in this country and worldwide by people in power. Then came the, the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown in mid-March. We are now entering our seventh month of this. And as beautiful as it is to be in this sanctuary, there are empty seats behind me in the choir loft. And they are likely to remain empty for months We have lost lives to COVID-19 in our own congregation. We know people. 
we love people who have lost their lives to COVID-19. Globally, almost a million people, over 957,000 people have died. And here in our own country, we're over 200,000 of them. We are four and a quarter percent of the world's population, but have suffered over 20% of the world's deaths. COVID-19 is far from the least of things, the most of things, all of the things that have happened in this year. We are in the throes of the pandemic of racism as well, which really came to a head with George Floyd's killing in July, but continues to roil us as a nation as we reckon with our historical past and with our current inequitable present. On top of that, there is climate change going on that is causing worldwide challenges all along the West Coast. Wildfires are blazing. I spoke with a friend and colleague of mine who is in San Jose, California last week. I was calling on Skype at four in the afternoon, 1 p.m. her time, and it was dark because of the layers of ash causing mid-afternoon to be like twilight. And remember the wildfires in Australia? The ones that, that pushed kangaroos and other indigenous wildlife into the suburbs? You remember that? It feels like eons ago, right? It was June. June. All 2020. And of course, the multiple tropical storms and hurricanes that are coming up through the Gulf of Me Mexico. One made landfall last week, Sally, destroying homes and flooding Alabama. as well as glacial walls beginning to fall. And then, yesterday, yesterday I got news nationally and locally. It was heart-wrenching. Nationally, of course, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, setting up more chaos, more division, more anger, more frustration within our governance. And I also learned personally in our own congregation that Maurice Horn's appeal was denied. This is heart-wrenching. And yet another example of how our criminal justice system in the United States of America privileges the wealthy. I don't know what to tell you. It's not fair. And it makes me want to crawl into a hole and die, to give up. It's too much. This is exactly where we find Jonah in our scripture lesson today. Jonah has been sent by God, as I told you the story briefly in the children's sermon, to Nineveh. He didn't want to go. The Ninevites have been horrible to his people. They are well known for their abusive behavior to all they conquer. They amputate hands. They gouge out eyes. They, they behead. They are known for their cruelty in asserting primacy over conquered countries. And 
Jonah doesn't want to give them any opportunity to repent at all. He tries to get out of it. But ultimately, he goes. And ultimately, much to his chagrin, much to everyone's surprise, Nineveh repents from the king on down. They, they put on sackcloth and ashes, and they repent. And God? God forgives. Jonah is angry. He is so angry. He stomps off to the outskirts of town to sulk. He is so mad. How dare you, God? That is not fair. And God, God grows a bush to shelter him, to cool him in the heat of the day. And Jonah. Jonah appreciates the bush. Jonah feels loved in that moment. Jonah knows that God has not abandoned him, even as God is showing love and grace to these people whom he loathes. God still loves Jonah. Jonah knows this as he sits in the cool of the breeze of the bush and wallows in his anger. Night falls, morning comes, and the Lord appoints a worm. It's hilarious, isn't it? He appoints a worm to come and eat up the bush. It dries out, it withers, it dies. And Jonah is left to suffer in the scorching sun. And Jonah is mad again. What's this about? And God is like, you know, I let you wallow. I gave you a day. I showed you I loved you. Now get over it. And Jonah is not happy. Jonah wants to know that he is loved more than the Ninevites. Don't you care for me, Bess? I've been faithful to you all along. How can you forgive these people? I want to be the most important to you. I mean, isn't that how we all feel? In truth, when you think about the people that you are the most angry at, whether it is, it is people that you will never know that are in governance or healthcare or, or the prison system or something like that, or people in your own family, people that are as close to you as right next door. If God comes and offers them forgiveness and offers them love, will there not be a part of you that is also angry? That says, wait, what about me? I thought you said you loved me, God. It's not fair. This is exactly what the disciples are looking for in their conversation with Jesus in our second scripture lesson today. This lesson is flanked by two others, one in which Peter wants to know where he is going to be in the kingdom of heaven, wants to know that he has primacy of place with the Lord Jesus Christ, and on the other side, after it, is one from James and John of Zebedee, who want to know that they will sit on the Lord's right hand. Hey, Jesus, we gave up everything for you. So when it comes time to go to heaven, we're going to be important, right? We're going to be the ones who have pride of place. We're your number one, right? And Jesus answers them with this parable, this story. The kingdom of heaven is like, he begins. 
And then he tells them. He tells them about a landowner who needs workers in his vineyard. He goes out early in the morning and there are all these people waiting to go work. And he sends them out. But first, first, he negotiates their pay. And their pay is a day's wages. What would have been a denarii back in the day? Enough to buy your daily bread. Enough to sustain you for that day. And the workers agree. This is fair. And they go off into the vineyard to work. The landowner shows up again at nine, at noon, at three, at five. Why are you not working? Nobody's invited us. Go into the vineyard. They do. He doesn't negotiate pay anymore with them. He just sends them off. They just make an assumption that they are going to work and they are going to receive pay. And then at the end of the day, he invites them to come forward for their pay. The last, the ones who only worked for an hour from five to six come first. And he pays them a full day's wage. They only worked for an hour. And they get paid for the whole day. Imagine their delight. They must be absolutely thrilled. And imagine... If you were one of those who worked all day long in watching this, what are you going to be thinking? Wow. If he's going to pay them a full day, a full day's wages, then, then what's he going to pay us? This is going to be our lucky day. But it's not. It doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, as each successive group comes up and gets paid, they all get paid the same. They all get paid equally. They all get paid one day's wages. And those that come last, that went out first, that worked all day long in the scorching heat, they are not happy. Yo, wait, that, that's not fair. And it certainly does not appeal to our sensibilities as fair, does it? Because we live in a system in which more is better, in which we strive to have more than anybody else, in which we want to make more money, we want to have more stuff, we want to, we want to have more everything, right? More is the epitome of best, of good living, of, of, of what we strive for, right? But here's the thing, God's economy is not our economy. Equity does not equal equality. It's not fair. No. No, it's not. It is not fair. But it is just. Every single person who works, who comes to the Lord, who is there and present in the vineyard, no matter when they get there, gets sustenance. Enough for what they need. Daily bread. Because that, in God's economy, is what we all need. We all need enough. We don't need more than anybody else. This is very hard for us to understand as human beings. It's not how we operate. It's not how our systems operate. It's not how our governance operates. It's not how the capitalistic society operates. It's not how our world operates. But it is how God operates. It's not fair. No, it's not. But God 
doesn't promise us fair. God promises us forgiveness. God doesn't promise us fair. God promises us God doesn't promise us fair. God promises justice. And we, as followers of God and Jesus Christ, are to strive for, to fight for forgiveness, love, and justice. Even when, no, especially when, Friends, as an uh, affirmation of our desire for God to take our lives and to use them for God's purposes, let us affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Yes, friends, uh, the God who in Christ sits on the throne even now in heaven is praying for and with us even in this moment. Let us lift our prayers to our loving, and gracious God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, Lord, we do give you thanks for the compassion with which you look down on all that you have created. Lord, for each of us who uh, in our journeys at various times does tend to either uh, look down on others or uh, seek others' uh, approval in such a way that we do not recognize you in the God spot of our lives. Lord, continue to come after us uh, embrace us with your mercy, with your promise never to leave or forsake us, with your invitation to provide manna for us on every step of our journey to being who you would have us be. Lord, enable us to uh, recognize that uh, so often we fail to see ourselves as the vessels of your spirit that you would have us be. That instead, on our own agenda, uh, seeking paths of our own sense of, of glory, or marching toward our own self-destruction, uh, we need you to stop us, redirect us, recognize 
the bounty that you would have for us if only were if only we were to receive what you have to offer lord enable us in our personal journeys and our collective sense of ministry in our understanding of who we are as neighbor to each other citizen alongside of each other and a traveler of the world for such a time and place as this that if we are to open ourselves to you and yield to who you would have us be not only would we receive the abundant life that you promise in jesus christ but our very life's witness would draw others to receive it as well so come by here enable us to be more perfectly shaped into uh, the living stones you would have us be so that together we would create a kingdom that was brought forth most perfectly through the life death and resurrection of the one who taught us to pray saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen friends all god asks of us is gratitude appreciation for all god has done in fulfilling his promise to provide for us our daily bread and our understanding that we believe god's promise to provide that daily bread for us tomorrow in that spirit let us rededicate even the first fruit of our labor and all that we have stewardship over to god's gospel work and i would invite you if you find the ministries of this congregation concert with your understanding of god's will to uh, join in us by giving your financial offerings using the link below at fpcgermantown.org slash giving or you can mail your donations to the first presbyterian church in germantown 35 west shelton avenue philadelphia pennsylvania 19144 <laughs> Now, as you enter into the week ahead, may you strive to emulate, to exemplify, to share God's love, 
forgiveness and justice with all you meet knowing that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all offers that same love, forgiveness, and justice to you and is in you, with you, and flowing through you now and forevermore. Amen.